Okay, so we're going to start talking about actual implementation of OSPF uh, v3. Now, of course, the first thing to do, the first thing we have to do is actually get IPv6 working. Step one with that is the IPv6 unicast routing command, um, which we learned all the way back in CCNA1. And frankly, everything on this screen uh, harkens all the way back to CCNA1 um, and our initial introduction to, uh, to IPv6. We go into the interface, we give it a description, we give it an IP address, we turn it on. Once that happens, um, we can um, keep going further. Now, the one thing that is not on this screen that is kind of in the topology diagram, but not in the uh, command configuration uh, e example is the link local address. Uh, there's a couple of things you should do here to minimize your confusion. You might be tempted um, if you're thinking about link local addresses the same way you think about uh, globally unique addresses to say, for example, on gig 00, do FE80 colon colon 1. On serial 000, do FE80 colon colon 2. Do, on serial 003, FE80 colon colon 3. That's the wrong approach to take with this. Because the uh, you, you, you will not create an address collision um, by giving all of the interfaces on a device the same link local address. The only way you can create an address collision is by putting the same link local address on opposite sides of the same link. Say, for example, um, 0000 on router 1 and 0000 on router 2. Um, when you decide, as you're deciding your address scheme, decide which link local address every router should use. And then every interface on that router gets the same link local address. So you can look at a link local uh, configuration somewhere else. Say, for example, if you're looking at the IP config command output in uh, Windows NT box, and you see a line that says default gateway FE80 colon colon 2. If you know that FE80 colon colon 2 belongs, so to speak, to router 2, then you know that this host is supposed to be connected to router 2. Now, if that host is not actually connected to router 2, that's a chance for you to catch a configuration mistake on your part. Now, um, so let's talk about the steps uh, in general terms to configure OSPF v3. Okay, so step one, we must always configure unicast routing. Turn unicast routing on so that these routers can start doing router advertisements, accepting router solicitation, they'll do neighbor discovery with each other, and that gives us a layer of information. Uh, remember, uh, because OSPF v3 um, has neighbor adjacency and IPv6 has neighbor adjacency, and there's link to or link la uh, la link layer neighbor adjacency with either um, CDP or LLTP. That's three separate chances, uh, three separate data points that you can use to troubleshoot um, a missing neighbor adjacency in OSPF v3. So turn them all on. Uh, make sure you can use all the tool kit tools in your kit, um, unless you have a very good reason to not use them. Say, for example, you're on a on a network that you don't want to allow, you want to make uh, lateral movement and network discovery as hard as humanly possible, you might turn off CDP or LLDP so that someone who compromises one of your devices can't use that fact to compromise others without a fair amount of guesswork. So, step two, uh, set up a link local address. Technically speaking, this is optional. Um, if you don't give it a link local address, it will make one up. Um, and we actually saw that you, if, if you've watched the demo for uh, three dot uh, for eight three three six that lab, you'll notice that one of my routers when I did um, show uh, IPv6 interface brief, uh, two of my interfaces had 
a configured link local address, FE80 colon, colon 1, one of my addresses had a much longer link local address, FE80 colon, colon and then a bunch of stuff. That bunch of stuff was generated dynamically by the device using the EUI64 process. So you don't have to, but it is a really good idea to do so. So you can then provide that information to your clients. You give your clients a link local gateway, a default gateway configuration, so they can't accidentally try to use the wrong router as the default gateway. Um, and then, more to the point, if you change the addressing of your gateway itself, you don't have to change everything. Um, okay, you do absolutely have to configure a 32-bit dotted decimal router ID in router configuration mode. This is essential um, on a router which is only speaking IPv6. On a router which is also using IPv4, if you don't give it a router ID, it will pick either the IPv4 router ID or one of the other phys one of the other IPv4 addresses you've got configured on the device, either a physical address or a loopback. Bottom line, configure it yourself. So you so there there should be a meaningful relationship between uh, the identity of the router um, and the router ID that should be in your documentation. There might even be a a meaningful relationship between your the, the identity of the router and the router ID and the link local address you're using on that router. Give yourself as many data points as possible that you can correlate, uh, that you can put together as you're troubleshooting the problem to realize, wait a minute, that doesn't look quite right. Um, so you can also configure optional specifics like your reference bandwidth. Um, you can set up your OSPF interface settings interface bandwidth, reference bandwidth, all that kind of stuff. We uh, All the things we talked about um, in uh, Lab 8245, and I've talked about in, in the OSPF v2 section, all of that uh, comes into play here as well, because fundamentally it is the same routing protocol. Uh, it handles reference bandwidth the same way. It handles costing the same way. It generates the same kind of, SP, uh, of SPF tree, link state database, etc. I mean, the definition of convergence hasn't changed. An OSPF uh, v3 area is converged when all the devices in the area have the same LSDB, just like OSPF v2. Finally, um, once you get past now, uh, uh, and now technically speaking. You could actually do um, step one, step two, step three, then step six, and then if you want to optimize for whatever reason, go back to steps four and step five. Um, I would honestly consider step six putting interfaces in the area much more important um, than reference bandwidth and uh, interface bandwidth, because frankly, if you don't do that, you haven't included any networks in the area. Um, you've got the, the potential uh, for an OSPF v3 uh, routing area, but until you put the net put if you put the until you put the interfaces in the area, there is no area. Or uh, particularly, I mean, if this is the if the first is, if the first router you're building out doesn't have any ref, any uh, interfaces in the area, or worse, if all the routers you're trying to build out don't have any interfaces in the area, you have the potential to form something but nothing real so really and truly unicast routing link local interface router id uh, assign your interfaces to the areas it that would be like trying to build out uh, ospf v2 with no network statements in router configuration it's got nothing to advertise and not nothing to advertise through which means it's got nothing to say and no one to talk to you're not going to have much of a conversation if no one it, imagine everyone sitting around a table saying nothing that's going to get boring fast and it's not very uh, productive so let's talk about verification a little bit okay so we're going to verify our addresses on the interfaces uh that you actually saw me doing this um if you watch the second half of the 8336 um, demo 
I made some typographical errors, some minor um, mistakes in my implementation, and I troubleshot some. Of, I use some of these tools in my troubleshooting. I noticed that hey, I don't have a link local, and then I noticed that hey, I gave the wrong prefix um, to my host. So, uh, like I said, these link local addresses are created natural uh, automatically, um, and I mentioned the EUI64 process. The dead giveaway for EUI64 is this character sequence smack in the middle of the address of the interface IT. FFE. Sorry, FFFE. Basically, it takes an FE80 colon colon 10 prefix. It takes your 48-bit MAC address for the NIC, and it transforms that into a serial line. Um, it, sorry, it not it doesn't run that for into a serial line. That's Sorry, wrong thing. Forget I said that. It transforms that into um, a 64-bit interface ID. It, now, it's not exactly the same as the MAC address. One of the other things it does is it reaches into the first byte of that address. It finds the global bit, the local bit, and it flips it to indicate yes. Um, it, I think it takes the global bit and flips it local. So yes, it indicates this is a local address only. So let's talk about assigning those manually. Okay, so uh, the command is IPv6 address and then the address you want to provide and link dash local. Um, if you do IPv6 address link dash local and then FE80 colon colon one, it won't know what you're talking about. Um, so you have to do it this way um, IPv6 uh, router ID. So your IPv6 router ID uses precisely the same process um, as uh, the selection process for IPv4. Now, it will tell you that it wants this first. Um, it'll notice that there is no router ID. Now, of course, the first time you create the process, of course, you haven't done the router ID because you have to be in the area. You have to be in that config mode to create the router ID. So you're always going to get this message the first time around. So you do router ID 1.1.1.1 or 2.2.2.2 or 33.33.33. .33 um, so usually, as, as with uh, IPv4, uh, if there's a 32-bit router ID configured, that takes effect. If that's not, if there's a loopback, that falls into place. If there's neither a router ID nor a loopback, if there is an IPv4 interface, that'll work. Um, and if none of those things happens, you'll get this message at the end of the pro at the end of the thing. So let's talk about modifying that right quick. Um, so um, the simplest way to do this is actually um, to sorry, simplest way to do this is actually to uh, change the router ID, then clear the process. Now, uh, as we noted in a previous uh, lab demo, if you create a loop back to do this and then clear the process, that won't take effect. Say, for example, you had a physical address, you created a loop back, you clear the process, the physical address will still be um, the router ID. Um, you'll literally have to reload the device, copy, run, start, then reload for this kind of, for a loop back to take effect. But if you do the router ID command specifically, then you do clear IPv6 OSPF process, it will, it, it will restart the OSPF process without loading everything. What it will do is it'll take the process down, it'll break all the neighbor adjacencies, it'll bring it back up, it'll reestablish them, it will reconverge, it will rebuild the routing table, and it'll know who is, what its router ID is. So let's talk about, uh, in the next video, I'll talk about implementing OSPF on these interfaces. Be right back.